I can see the thing that I put in just showing up in the way, like just showing up in, in the same way that I saw it. And maybe it's aggregated and it's fast. And like, I think that's what people actually want. And all of the star schema and all of that data modeling, um, when you get to it, I think that a lot of that is a function of, um, so it turns into storage optimizations. Mm. And it, 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 turn, it tends to shrink storage down because it like deduplicates dimension values, turns them into a fixed width number. And then you can store the fixed width number in the database table. And that shrinks the, the size of say your fact table, for example. Um, the, personally, I think that those optimizations were likely very important in the 80s and 90s. Hmm. And now in the 2000s, part of the whole NoSQL thing, I think was to a certain degree challenging some of that stuff. What's up? Welcome to this edition of the Data Nerd Herd. In this episode, I got to interview Eric Shedder, one of the original creators of Apache Druid. He is the field CTO at Imply, the company behind Apache Druid. We talk about the divergence and convergence of databases, moving from the back office to a product, where data is going over the next few years, modeling fast moving data, and his pastime as a gamer. So this is a fun discussion and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. How's it going? Going well. Good. Going well, awesome. thanks for having me here. Yeah, anytime, anytime. Um, so today we have uh, Eric Shetter. Um, for people who don't know who you are, do you want to give a quick intro? Uh, sure. I'm the uh, how to how, how to intro. Uh, uh, well, the thing I commonly say is I, I wrote the first lines of code in Druid, um, and Ooh. so this was maybe ten-ish years ago, I guess, something like that. I don't know. I I, uh, I remember when I was young, and people would be like, "Oh, I don't remember how old I am," and all of that sort of stuff. I would kind of make fun of them, but now as I get older, I, I find I do the same thing with projects and everything. But anyway, um, the uh, yeah, I, I wrote the first lines of code in Druid. I've done a lot of stuff with data uh, over a while. I've worked at a number of different companies. Um, though Yahoo, Splunk, a company called Ning that uh, probably very few people have heard of, but for Is people who have heard network? of it. Yeah, it was, it was a build your own social network for anything. That was my first job out of college, actually. Interesting. Um, I do remember Ning, actually. Uh, 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 yeah, um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a fun place to be. But yeah, and, and right now I'm the, I'm the field CTO at Imply. We are uh, kind of the company around the Apache Druid project, and um, I'm just focus on helping customers get value out of the infrastructure because uh, I don't know, infrastructure is only interesting when it's applied to an actual problem. Mm. It's not just in and of itself. It, it, it's not all that useful. Oh, well, infrastructure is of course useful. It's just, anyway, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, walk me through that. I mean, you know, we, uh, Ternary Data, we're partners with Imply. Um, I, I think I first came across Druid back in, was it 2015? Something like that. I think it first came on my radar then. And mm -hmm. it's like, it seems really cool. Um, so, but walk me through that. I mean, you know, that it's, it's an impressive uh, feat of engineering too, I would say. And it solved, a, a, I would think, a pretty, at the time, a pretty interesting problem that really wasn't solved that well uh, until Druid came around. So walk me through, what was the inspiration for, for Druid? What was the, the inspiration? So if we, um, if we go all the way back to the inspiration. Uh, it was, it was actually, the inspiration actually came from some things that a, a coworker of mine when I was at LinkedIn said. Uh, and, but to, to kind of um, tell this story, uh, it, we, so Druid came out of a company, a startup called MetaMarkets. We were in the ad tech space. The company itself was, um, attempting to build a market on top of the ad tech auction markets. And that's why it's meta markets. Um, and the idea there was that they would, uh, or we, we would get marketplace data, like auction data from the advertising markets. 
give them dashboards in return. And then we would turn around, combine that into like derivatives and, and financial things and sell that to make money. I didn't understand any of the derivative stuff, but when I looked at the data and, and stuff, I had been working with data and was like, I know how to deal with that data. And so I joined, we did things. We started out uh, trying to use uh, Greenplum at the time. This was 20, 20, oh, 2011, 2010, 2011. So mm. a while back, we started out trying to use Greenplum. It, it kind of worked. Uh, we needed to go distributed. That would have required a license. We would have had to pay money. We didn't have money. Um, so uh, we then went to the next hot thing at the time, which was Hadoop plus HBase plus all that stuff. And so we went to like, we're going to pre-compute a bunch of things, do it. Uh, we started doing that, ran into um, combinatorial explosions in the pre-compute and we're like, well, what are we gonna do next? And at that point, I remembered some conversations. Um, as I mentioned, from when I was at LinkedIn, there was uh, someone named John Wang, who at that point they had open sourced a search platform that LinkedIn was using at the time. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened with the project since, but uh, they had open sourced that. And one of the things when uh, I was talking with him about it was he was like, yeah, we just pull the indexes into memory and then process it in memory. And guess what? When things are in memory, it's fast. And I, that had kind of stuck with me. And so the very first thing of Druid was, okay, if I take all this data and put it into an array of longs in Java and then add it up, how fast is that? And I just did that real quick. And it was super fast. And I was like, oh, mm. this is fast. If it's in memory, it's fast. Okay. And that kind of started everything. Interesting. Uh, oh. I, mean, I don't so, know. Did that make sense? <laughs> no, that made total sense. Yeah, I was actually just chatting with a friend of mine the other day. He, he was um, uh, talking about um, uh, Druid, and, and he said that I think the first what was the first line of code that you wrote? I think you said it was like it was a letter C or something for for class or something. So um, <laughs> something like that. I thought it was kind of funny. So he's like, "Yeah, you definitely got to ask Eric about that." But um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, it, it, it's it's it's. So, I mean, it didn't seem like there was much available that sort of solved this problem of, of low latency queries back in the day. I mean, I think there were things that sort of did it, but not in an analytical fashion. I mean, yeah, there, there wasn't. Like, I remember some of the other things we evaluated. Um, OpenTSDB was, existed at, the point, at that point in time, and that was a thing. But, um, like, one of, the, one of the differences, so being born in ad tech data, being born from advertising um, uh, like auctions, uh, there's demographic data attached to the auctions. There's a bunch of different websites attached to the auctions. There's really what traditional like TSDBs and, and um, other data systems would consider high cardinality dimensions attached to that data. And when we evaluated like T open TSDB and, and TSDB type space, even, even today, that cardinality, the, the ephemeral nature of some of those values and that cardinality tends to, to kind of push the limits. And so, yeah, there, there, at that point in time, there wasn't, there wasn't really too much out there uh, that could handle really high cardinality, arbitrary aggregations mm. and, and fast low latency queries. Interesting. Did you have to do a lot of research uh, and like reading white papers and stuff to kind of figure out, you know, how it, how it, um, how, how other approaches been on this or like? I don't know. I'm probably supposed to say yes, but uh, to to be <laughs> to be honest, and I don't know. We were in startup land. We were just yeah. kind of trying to make a thing happen, and so cool. ra rather than doing like exhaustive research, it was more well. I've done some things with HBase. I know these people in HBase land. Let me see what they're doing. Oh, yeah. I know. I, I I know these other people. Let me talk with them. And it, it, it was more like just the things that were top of mind, the, the people that I knew talking with them, exploring that, and then just saying, whatever, let's do a thing. Mm -hmm. um, That's awesome. Yeah. It, cool. it didn't start out. We didn't start 
believing it was going to go open source either. We started out just building infrastructure to solve the problem that was sitting in front of us. And then afterwards we kind of realized, oh, maybe this is more generally applicable. Interesting. Why did you open source it? Um, yes, it seemed like a good idea <laughs> to, uh, to be honest. Like, uh, uh, I mean, since then I can, where, where we are now, I can go back and, and uh, make up all sorts of reasons why it was. Yeah, sure. Idea. But yeah. um, at, at the time, like, I mean, even, even when it was built, we used a lot of Hadoop. Uh, we used a, a lot of a, a whole bunch of other open source things in order to make the company to even make the company uh, happen and get started. And so it just kind of seemed like contributing back um, was a meaningful thing. Some of some of the other thought processes was that, like, generally speaking, data infrastructure has been open source Mm -hmm. or, and at that time, like with the Hadoop ecosystem and all of that, it was all open source. And so it felt a lot like no matter what we do, even if we try and keep it proprietary, something is going to come out open source and effectively commoditize the infrastructure. And so getting ahead of that and trying to, to be the thing that um, commoditizes this kind of layer. Right seemed like, like a way to kind of uh, keep things going forward. Um, another thing another thing that I think has proven true, uh, which this is something I heard. Uh, so I worked, um, I worked very closely with Jay Kreps at LinkedIn when I was there and something he talked about with open source, because like a lot of the things he worked with aside from Kafka, There was this other thing called Voldemort and this other thing called Azkaban that were all kind of open source projects that came out of his team. Um, And uh, something he he said that I think really resonates with me, especially now, is that when you're in a kind of larger technology company, uh, a lot of times the, the roadmap for infrastructure is from product from the product side of the world gets entirely defined based on basically the product that you need to expose to the end customer. But that roadmap doesn't necessarily push and stretch the infrastructure in terms of what it can do. And so by open sourcing the infrastructure, you actually then get exposure to a lot of other ideas of what that infrastructure mm-hmm. could do from a lot of other different engineering groups. And that ends up creating a broad and robust roadmap, like technical roadmap for infrastructure and the different problems that it can solve rather than uh, having it be uh, a little bit myopically focused on just uh, one problem. And I think that that has definitely proven true. That's really cool. Yeah, I see that a lot too. Um, And then you started a company off of it. So that's kind of (laughs) cool. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. I mean, walk me through that transition too. I mean, I, I think, cause this is one of the um, earlier, uh, I would say examples of, um, you know, an open source project becoming, you know, a company. I know it's since then, this is like kind of a, a dime a dozen. You mentioned Jake Krabs and obviously he has a lot of success with Kafka mm-hmm. and Confluent, but you know, I think I, I still consider Druid and Imply one of maybe the earlier examples of that. I mean, when did it make sense to, to form a company around uh, Druid? Oh, when did it make sense to form a company? So um, to be completely honest with this, I, uh, I did not found Imply around right. Druid. I, I, uh, I went the, the big company route and, and instead mm-hmm. was using Druid at companies like, um, like Yahoo right. to kind of connect the dots on, on um, like using it for a purpose. And so mm-hmm. the, question, the question specifically about like, where did the the founding of imply mm-hmm. um i'm i'm not necessarily the best person to answer but the yeah. i think I, I i think so at that point at the point that it happened it had been open source for a couple of years i think it had started to gain a little bit of the snowball of momentum of people kind of kicking the tires playing with it um it i think it had become clear that okay if there's real investment put into this, that snowball can keep rolling. 
And so that that's kind of the point where once you get a, a little bit of that traction, once you get some traction such that you think you can keep the snowball rolling, that that's the point probably to jump on and um, mm-hmm. go after it. Yeah, I'm seeing this a lot with my friends' companies. Um, yeah, it seems like the open source to uh, the hybrid kind of open source and commercialized open source um, you know model is just taken off. I got friends who have raised, you know, a lot of money just based upon the number of people in their Slack channels now. It's <laughs> kind of crazy. So I didn't, didn't know that was a metric back in the day, but now it is. And, you know, you got a captive audience and yep, you yep. can raise money on that. So it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. It's, it's probably similar to like uh, Instagram influencers or something, just like the number of people that have subscribed to you all of a sudden uh, you're, you're that that's like a monetary asset. You know, yeah, it probably is. Like, and so, you know, you, you joined recently. Did you join recently as a field CTO then at, at Imply? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's how it yeah. up. Last uh, in the beginning of July of this year. So almost six months now. Oh, wow. Nice. Cool. Congrats. It's a fun job, I bet. So. Yes. Yes, it is. I get to, uh, I get to see what people are doing, mm-hmm. uh, are, are doing with Druid, doing with Imply and that, um, I don't know. It's a lot of exposure to a lot of different ideas and a lot of different kind of problems, which is what I like. That's that's the thing that kind of keeps me going. And what, me what, are, what are some of the the, the cooler um, examples of of how Druid's being used these days? Um. So I'm pausing because part of this is I don't know how much I can actually share. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. So. The, um, I don't know, there, there, there've been some, um, some cool things in kind of healthcare Mm -hmm. that, uh, learning about them kind of opened my eyes to, to different ideas of, of, oh, that's a thing where it's like the mix of, of, uh, medical research and um, kind of the needs of the research community and kind of studies and stuff like that has, anyway, uh, there's been some stuff around that, that that's been a little bit, in, that, that's been pretty interesting. Um, there's also, uh, there's also, I'd, I'd say there's a pattern kind of emerging of, um, I don't know, getting, getting embedded into Hmm. the actual product of a number of our customers where like it turns out that having data, having access to data at low latency and uh, in a scalable fashion actually enables them to introduce like brand new experiences and and brand new parts of their product that really expand uh, their own value proposition. And that that's been, um, that's been an interesting kind of notion that's uh, come out of a lot of this because it's real data. It's not, it's not just like analysts sitting in, sitting, sitting around writing SQL anymore. It's, it's like mm-hmm. right, right in your face up front uh, in the actual product to where someone might not even know that they're interacting with a, a kind of analytical OLAPI style database behind the scenes. It's a trend I'm starting to see too. Uh, embedded analytics, and I would say like data, data products or data applications, um, mm-hmm. and not, like you say, not in the sense where it, it's kind of the old-fashioned days, um, you know, kind of back office. Uh, you know, Dilbert's back there making a, you know, a dashboard. <laughs> right, kind of right, so, and then the pointy-haired manager. Uh, yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. Like you had basically like five people using the app or something like that. Nowadays, mm-hmm. you know, this could be you know hundreds, thousands, millions of people, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So like, walk me through that. I mean, kind of where do you see the data space going over the next few years in that, in that uh, kind of context? It seems like, um, you know, data is becoming more front and center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I, think that's, um, I think that's exactly true. And I think that's what, that's what we're seeing, where if you go back, well, at least the, the industry, as I initially came into it, data, Hadoop, all of, all of that space was very much kind of being used for, oh, let's, let's process our logs, let's process our access logs to understand what our users are doing and, and all of this. And it was always like 
generating reports that are going up to the executives of a company and they're using it in like board meetings and, and real back office use cases um, is kind of where that stuff started. I think that's where, say, uh, a lot of data warehousing stuff is still um, kind of front and center because like that's never going to go away. Businesses got to report on, bus- on what businesses are doing, right? Um, you you got to know that. But what we're seeing, though, is, is that as basically as you have all of that data in your data lake or, or whatever, as you, as you have all of that sitting there, some of the data is uh, like each individual data point is kind of low value. And so you don't want to spend that much money on it, but you can sometimes combine a bunch of those low value data points into a super high value data point. And that high value data point or that combination of data points can then be exposed to end customers in uh, data products and, and what you're seeing. And so like, I think the first, the first example I can go back to of this was um, at LinkedIn. I remember one of the things that was uh, a scary, creepy, but awesome feature was uh, people you may know where mm-hmm. you would go to LinkedIn and it would like give you a list of people that you might know. And you would be like, wait, why are you telling me that I know that person? Because I do know that person. Um, and like that, that behind the scenes, that was using data. Of course, it didn't use Druid. Druid didn't exist at the time, but that, that was using data in order to come up with those recommendations and put them out. Uh, Amazon's got a whole bunch of stuff about like people who bought this product also buy these products and a lot of those things, which is once again, using data to actually go into the product. Um, there's, and kind of as we, and basically these things started as like company, as the big companies figuring out how to put a little bit of data into their, their experiences. But I think what we're seeing now is more and more kind of startups coming along and saying, okay, we need data in our experience. As you get into, uh, SaaS products as well. The company is delivering a SaaS, but they also have to tell you how it's working. They also have to give you visibility into how it's working, what your billing is, where your billing is going to. Um, When a large company purchases a SaaS, there's lots of different parts of that company that will use the SaaS. And so the people administering that account need to know, okay, who's using, who's using this the most? Where does, where's the money coming from? Why, like, who's driving most of my costs and like, there's a lot of, I think in that SaaS world, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of needs for just understanding how things are going, where they're going, and all of that to be exposed uh, back to the end user as well as uh, used internally. And that's, anyway, I feel like I'm rambling at this point, but anyway, that's- No, a, that's no a, I experienced this today. I actually ordered something off of DoorDash, which, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because these are technologies you take for granted today, um, you know. But, you know, a few years ago, like several years ago, I don't know, it felt like that was something out of science fiction, like, just click a few buttons, order food, then it shows up. But it's very much an analytical problem, right? I mean, they, mm-hmm. they give any metrics on the fly, like, oh, this is going to be here in uh, 20 minutes. Just kidding. It'll be here in 17. And I'm like, that's interesting. Um, you're pretty accurate. And, and lo and behold, they show up on time. Yes. Right. It's like they have it dialed or something. It's because they <laughs> probably do with it's their business. I would hope so. Um, so, but yeah, it's more and more of these products. Uh, you know, Uber's kind of the same way too, or I mean, that's essentially a data product in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's that's fascinating. I mean, you mentioned data warehouses earlier. I'd like to kind of get your take on this. Like where we're starting to see this new generation of of low latency OLAP databases. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, you know, you have uh, you know, a lot of data warehouse vendors out there kind of sticking in the traditional kind of batch oriented mm-hmm. world. Um, kind of where do you, where do you think everything kind of settles? Do you think that the data warehouses ultimately go low latency or do they just, or is there just going to be a world where there's these two types of technologies that continue to exist or do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I mean, if, if we go super macro, <laughs> I think all of these things tend to tend to go through um, divergence and convergence mm, kind yeah. of shifts where um, there was a point in time where there were like 
all sorts of different types of databases, all of them converged into RDBMSs. Then 10-ish years ago, the whole NoSQL stuff started and we went into another divergence cycle. And now I'd say uh, we're back. I, I think we're either at the tipping point, if not starting to get back into another convergence cycle where people are figuring out, um, okay, these are, these are the new paradigms. These are the new patterns mm -hmm. of the world. And so that I do think that that's going to end up converging somehow. Now, in what, in what way is that going to converge? Um, I think that's an interesting question. On the topic of data warehouses versus kind of data applications, mm -hmm. um, I actually think th there are fundamental technical differences between the needs of the two kind of personas and the two products. And to, to talk about that, actually, um, one of the big things, so I was mentioning earlier, uh, the individual value of any one data point in a data warehouse is either unknown or generally low. Hmm. And the value of the data warehouse comes from having a significant amount or having all of the data there where it's cheap enough to hold the unknown or low individual data points. And so uh, the data warehouse kind of world, I think ends up being driven by, okay, how do we make it cheaper and cheaper to hold all of the data and make it available, hmm. but hold it? So because um, generally speaking, you're just trying to get stuff in there so that you can figure out the value later. And so a lot of times the, the data goes in there without you knowing uh, what the value of it is yet. And so this drives all of the data warehouses, all of that infrastructure towards the idea of separation of storage and compute. Because once you've attached compute to the storage, you're now paying for something. You're paying for that CPU when you don't even know if you're going to use it. And so it drives them, it, it drives the infrastructure towards that strong separation. And, and then that takes the cost structure around just storing the data down to just storage and make it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, on the flip side, the, do the downside to this, so Druid's very, very first version actually had complete separation of storage and compute. Oh, really? The data 100% existed in S3. And in response to a query, Druid would download the data from S3 and process it. Um, with the application experiences, with the data experiences that we were powering, what this meant is that every time I deployed new code, I had to take a downtime and issue queries for all of our tenants so that the data was preloaded so that their application mm. experience was, would actually be fast because that download of data would take a while. And it would take a while, time out the experience. If the end customer actually interacted with that, they would have a horrible experience because their data wouldn't be there. It would take minutes for it to show up. Things would time out. They would be like WTF, flip a table, walk away, right? Um, and so for what we were targeting with Druid, the separation of storage and compute wasn't actually the right thing, what we actually had to do was pre-cache mm. and preemptively cache and make the data available in an always on fashion. Because when you're targeting query SLAs in the milliseconds or sub-seconds, you, you don't have time to download gigabytes or terabytes right. from S3 or GCS. Like it just doesn't, it, it, it's not a thing. And so this, um, this kind of separation where I think the the needs of the data warehouse pushes that infrastructure very hard on how do you store unknown or low value individual data points as cheaply as possible, where the needs of the kind of data application pushes infrastructure towards how do you make sure that you can maintain query SLAs at a high degree of concurrency um, with, uh, uh, like, with the simplest to manage infrastructure. And, and so like, if there's a difference, if the, if these worlds don't converge, it's, I believe it's going to be because of that, that central kind of difference between the usage patterns. That actually makes a ton of sense. Um, 
Yeah, it's funny. I was just writing about that in my book the other day, what kind of the uh, hot and warm and cold data and, and just the various ways that you're going to, um, you know, persist data for various use cases. Right. And then it, it comes down mm -hmm. to latency too. what, like you say, what's the SLA mm -hmm. entirely depends, you know, some, for some people that I talk to real time means um, like every day, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. It's like I had one, I had one, one client that was like, "Yeah, real time. If we can just get that once a month, that'd be great." And like, I okay, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but other yes. people, it's like I need it like now. I, I don't. Right. When I say now, like now. So now, it's, yeah. it's just interesting the um, uh, just the varied degrees of expectations. But I would say, I would think that you know as as people become more exposed to just faster data, you know, it's I don't mm -hmm. know. I just think the expectations are going to kind of write themselves, so to speak. So. I, absolutely. I think like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go super philosophical and, and for, uh, uh, for a second here, but um, I think humanity as a whole, uh, we're very good at just accepting what's in front of us, taking it for granted and wanting the next thing. And so my, my like read on the differences for those people is the person who's saying, yeah, if I can get it once a month, they're in a world where they're like, excuse me, where they're thinking, oh, I can only get this once a quarter, man, once a quarter, that, that's not good. I want it once a month now. And right. once they get it once a month, they'll be like, okay, I can get this once a month. I want it once a week. I want it once a day. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they'll be like, can I get this once an hour? And then after that, they'll, they'll, they'll go to the next. And like at, at each phase, once, once you get something or once humanity like gets something, you then take it for granted and then are like, okay, how do I, how do I get to the next point of optimization? How do I like with this as my baseline, what's the next thing to optimize? And um, I think, I don't, I don't know. The, the reason I go to this is uh, in the, I, don't know, I was having a conversation with a friend uh, about kind of free lunches. Hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in Silicon Valley companies, a lot of them offer free lunch. Some of them don't. Now with COVID and all of that stuff going on, people aren't in the office. So I don't, I don't know what the current state of the free lunch is, but my experience, I've been at a couple of companies and I've been at ones that give you free lunch. I've been at ones that don't. And I noticed something where anytime I go to a company with free lunch, initially I'm like, oh man, this is awesome. I love having lunch. This is great. After three to six months, I get to a point where I'm like, man, this lunch is boring. Maybe I need to go out and pay money for lunch. And, and, and it's like, wait, why would you pay money for lunch when you get free lunch? This, this makes no sense. But you get to that point where you're like, oh, the lunch that they provide, it's so repetitive and boring and, and uh, all of that stuff that um, you go. But then, then you're in that mind of like, oh man, this free lunch is boring and all this. And then you, you go and you go to a company that doesn't provide lunch. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the fact that there's no lunch becomes a big thing. It's like, oh my God, there's no lunch here. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> how, do I, like, how do I deal with life anymore? And, and uh, then, then like you, get, you get used to that. And then you go to a company that has lunch again, and you're like, man, lunch is awesome for three to six months until you've, you've gotten to the point of it, it being boring again. Anyway, so like this cycle of, just whatever you're dealt with, you get used to it. You set it as a baseline and then kind of find the next thing to do is, uh, I don't know. I, I think it's a, a commonality in humanity. Oh, it totally is. Yeah. Just expectations and stuff. Mm -hmm. So just tell everyone their data is going to be there about a day late and then they'll, you'll be <laughs> right, nothing right. but upside. And so <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can solve all scaling problems of a product by just getting rid of your users too. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Where do you think, you know, in, in a low latency environment, I mean, where, where does machine learning fit into um, the picture, do you think? So I think that's an, um, that's an interesting question. I think machine learning, so I think in recent years, we're, actually starting to figure out how to be able to use it <laughs> is, is, is what I'd say, where I think uh, for a while, machine learning, everyone said they did mach machine learning. Right. 
it, but if you went back behind the scenes, machine learning basically equated to, I'm going to add up some numbers, compare it to a value. And if it's greater than it, I'm going to just do one thing. And if it's less than it, I'm going to do another and, uh, and we're done. Um, where more recently, uh, I think it's, it's getting better and better. Um, I think deep learning seemed to have been a, a bit of a turning point, like the introduction of deep learning seemed to be a, a bit of a turning point in uh, kind of where, how, where and how machine learning is getting applied to the world. Um, now, after saying that, I'll say that I'm not that deep in, uh, in machine learning. And so I'm more talking from like an external observer thinking, yeah. Oh, what what can uh, what's this going to do? How how are things kind of going? How are they changing over time? And um, where is that going? I think from what we see a lot, actually, th this is one of the interesting. The getting back to the question of interesting applications of say Druid and Imply um, in this machine learning space. So we don't we we don't tend to play in the mach in the model building world. Uh, there's other infrastructure that tends to be much more well suited for actual model building. But one thing I, I didn't think about and realized was a, an actual need after kind of joining Imply and seeing a number of our customers do it is that when you build a model and you put it into production, especially some of the newer models where it's hard to kind of, it's hard to suss out why it made a choice that it made. Hmm. You tend to need another system that is kind of sitting over the choices that the model's making and giving you visibility and transparency into what it's doing so that you can then understand that, yes, this model is doing what I want or no, it's not. Or, oh, it looks like in this one kind of uh, for this one tranche of users or this one type of, of question, the model's not doing good things. And so we've actually seen people... Um, basically take the inputs and outputs of their model, dump that off as events into a system uh, like Druid or Imply, and then use that to kind of gain visibility into what the model's doing so that they can build an intuition for kind of how that's set up and where, uh, where those things are going. And that, that to me was, a, was an interesting cool. idea of like, oh, yeah, you, I, I don't know, to... It, it kind of answers the question of who watches the watcher kind of a thing. Mm. Like, how do you, if you can't make sense of what the model is actually doing, how do you make sure that it's not doing bad things? And what you can do is you can watch the inputs and outputs in that comparison and just be like, okay, can I, can we find areas where it's kind of making suboptimal decisions and then go and adjust the model to kind of fix it? Or you could do AB tests across the models and use that data to evaluate them and yeah, for like sure. That. Yeah, you see a ton of um, activity in the observability space. I think whatever I think that's what it's called now, um, model observability or data observability or something. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting. I mean, because I, I think the the notion is you know a lot of companies nowadays I notice in, in the data space they want to build like the data dog for ML, ML models or for oh. data or whatever. Right, it's a hugely popular space. I think. I can't go a day without finding a new product in that space or like meeting somebody who's doing a, you know, something in there. And it's, it's, it's fascinating for sure. And I think to your point, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a really good use case for, you know, sort of the fast analytics where, you know, mm -hmm. you model, if you get sale, you should do something about it sooner than later, because you're going to start making a lot of costly decisions and uh, actions. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah. interesting. No, absolutely. Yeah, another thing I want to talk to you about or ask you about is um, the data modeling. So, I mean, in the data warehouse world, there's like star schemas and, you know, I think established practices with data models. I don't see as much going on in sort of the, the next gen, what I, you know, I, I call them next gen um, OLAP uh -huh. databases, like you know, your Druids, you know, your click houses, your firebolts and that kind of stuff. But like, do you have any thoughts on, um, you know, data modeling with, with fast, hot data? Y yes. So how to describe it? Uh, the, so don't, well, that, so that's not actually the, the answer. Don't, don't mm. data model is not the answer, but it is kind of the answer. I'd, I'd say um, my mental model 
say as we've developed druid as as we've done other things was uh so coming working in the hadoop world working with uh, a bunch of things i had a lot of hadoop pipelines that did etl jobs and like pulled things out and joined dimensions on and and did all of that sort of stuff and um those are annoying they're like really annoying jobs especially when you're dealing with like if you're writing an application and that application is generating some data point and you're then trying to visualize those data points in aggregate you're writing the application and you're doing the visualization why do you have to like do all this stuff to extract dimensions and then join them back on in order to do the visualization it's just wasted effort in in my mind to where what i want what i think developers actually want is okay i'm in my application world i created the event the event went out on the kafka now the events in the system and now i can see the exact same thing that i put in and if i have multiple of them i can see them added up i can see them right. so, like i can see i can see the thing that i put in just showing up in the way like just showing up in, in the same way that I saw it and maybe it's aggregated and it's fast. And like, I think that's what people actually want. And all of the star schema and all of that data modeling, um, when you get to it, I think that a lot of that is a function of, um, so it turns into storage optimizations hmm. and it, 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 turn, it tends to shrink storage down because it like deduplicates dimension values, turns them into a fixed width, number and then you can store the fixed width number in the database table and that shrinks the the size of say your fact table for example um the personally i think that those optimizations were likely very important in the 80s and 90s hmm. and now in the 2000s part of the whole no sequel thing i think was to a certain degree, challenging some of that stuff. Like no SQL, people were annoyed with SQL, but I think it was more like talking about the divergence convergence cycle. I think it was more just challenging. Okay, this is the box of the relational database. There's the star right. schemas, there's the SQL language, there's all of this other stuff. People latched onto SQL because that's the interface. But I think that really what was being challenged was the kind of data organization stuff, the star schema, the uh, all of those things. Um, and I think that the future, especially in the kind of low latency analytics space, has more of that data modeling kind of pushed into the systems that are dealing with the data and less as say ETL stuff. And so the example I give is that actually in Druid, um, we take all of the data that comes in and chunk it up into what we call segments. Right. Inside of each segment is actually a little mini star schema where we have, uh, it, it's called dictionary encoding, but we have a dictionary for all of the dimension values. And that's basically mm -hmm. the exact same as a dimension table. It, it's not the exact same because dimension tables can have multiple columns in it and blah, 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 blah. But logically speaking, it's effectively the exact same idea as a dimension table with a fact table where we've built that star schema local to the segment. And so you could argue that Druid uses star schemas because it kind of does inside of a segment, but when you're actually interacting with it, you're not, you don't know that you're dealing with a star scheme. You don't know, or you don't have to know or not have to care that underneath it, the data happens to be um, laid out as a star schema. Hmm. It's just being done for you by the system. And when you issue the query, it's undoing it magically for you without you needing to like tell it you want to do join on this thing or that thing or the other. And I think that that's going to be a much more common pattern of making it so that the ETL jobs just aren't necessary. The data comes in, it's in the format that it's in, and you can interact with it um, like as it exists without needing hardcore ETL jobs. That's an interesting point. I'm going to have to noodle on that for a while. That's, um, 
Because, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, when you you, um, come from like the data warehouse world, there's this uh, dogma that everything has to be, it has to be in Kimball where it doesn't count, basically, is kind of the thinking. So, or data vault or inman or whatever. But, you know, I I think that if you, if you, you know, I think you're right when you read through um, or when you read through like Ralph Kimball's book, right? I mean, that was written during a time that referenced relational databases, not not column source either, but actual like row based, you know, and, because of technical limitations in a lot of cases, that's why you do it this way. But then, you know, I've been thinking lately, okay, streaming data, um, what's the equivalent for that? Like, how do you capture business logic? Do you need to do that? Um, it's, but I, yeah, that's why I enjoy talking to people like yourself who I think have a really good opinion on this because I haven't found anything really written on this. It's like, there's batch and modeling as it's existed for probably the, the like the 90s, 30 years almost. Mm-hmm. Um, or longer actually. Um, and then, you know, you get into uh, streaming and it's like, there's nothing. And the people mm-hmm. I talk to, I echo what you're saying, which is basically like, yeah, I don't think you need to do anything actually. So mm-hmm. just get your data and go. So Yeah, I, th- I think the, the, the one bit of modeling. So after saying all of that stuff about you don't need to do modeling, I think that's <laughs> focused on ETL stuff. The one thing yeah. that you, ha- you do need to do is... Um, when you're imagining the product experience that you want to expose, you sometimes need to go back and adjust the data that you're generating right. to align with that experience. And that, um, like when you don't have the ETL jobs in the middle, it becomes so much easier to do because then you know, okay, I generate this thing over here on the other side, I'm going to see that thing. And so it's like, oh, I need to expose this thing in my product experience. Great. I'm, I'm missing this one data point, let me go add that. I know it's going to just show up without me doing any ETL work. Great. It showed up. Now I can expose it. The world is happy. Um, That's really fascinating. Yeah. I'm curious to see where this goes. I mean, you know, in one hand, there's this giant collision course right now with uh, like Snowflake and Databricks, right? Like they're going head to head, I think for that land grab. Right. But Mm -hmm. then there's just, it seems like there's this whole other area of databases right now in the old app world where it's like, you know, the Druids, Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and low latency, um, you know, databases like that. And that's, mm-hmm. that's where I've been paying a lot of attention lately. Cause I think this is just, um, I mean, these things have been around for a while, but I think they're finally starting to catch on, uh, you know, with. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think users, so. uh, like, I, I, I definitely agree. I think the other thing that's really important in the space of the kind of low latency stuff and the, 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 another major point of differentiation is just um, operations and uptime. Mm. And like the amount of work that's required to scale out because data, when you're dealing with data, when you're dealing with large amounts of data, you absolutely need to add new nodes. At some point in time, you're going to add new nodes. Like the whole point of having a distributed system is so that you can add new nodes when you need right. more capacity. Like that, that's, that's the entire point of having it. And so um, like one of, one of the other kind of key things in a lot of this, and this is kind of hidden from the users because they're just asking queries and getting responses. But for someone delivering the actual infrastructure, having being in a world where you can just say, oh, I need more capacity, here's more servers, I'm done, and go pay attention to something else is massive, it's major. It's huge. Where um, being, being in a world where a lot of, a lot of a lot of systems in the data space kind of still like the best partitioning, the best way to kind of evenly spread load across nodes and get even workloads and uh, avoid hotspots is to effectively just hash, hash the data out across all of your nodes and engage all nodes on every query. And that's still a, a pattern that is seen in kind of some infrastructure, but that setup leads you to stuff. So one, one of the most, I think it's still true about it, but one of the probably most uh, well-known pieces of infrastructure that does this is Redshift or ParXL mm-hmm. that then became Redshift. And like, if you want to scale that up, it's it's a whole orchestrated process that Amazon does for you, of course. But where it, it like shuts off reads or it shuts off writes, it rehashes things into a new thing to scale out and do all of that. And like that that as a pattern, I think is. Um, going to go away just because it it's too like it's too hard 
<laughs> for someone to think about like all of those steps and, and make it happen. Of course you can automate it, but it's kind of annoying to, to deal with that sort of you stuff. You give me PTSD. I was literally just doing that with Redshift the other day. So okay. <laughs> it's like, why, why do I have to do it this way? This sucks. Um, yeah. yeah. And then all the, uh, what else was I complaining about? Low level networking configurations they had to do to use another AWS service. It's like, can't you just make this easy? Like these are literally the same products you're selling that should work. And I have to set up like S3 endpoints and NAT gateways and all this other fun mm -hmm. stuff. I'm like, why in 2022 yeah. almost do I have to do this? This is crazy. Um, anyway, that's my yeah. life. <laughs> and anything, anytime something comes down to the network layer, I, I, uh, I, I wave it off as, oh, it's probably there because of some security concern. And sure. so therefore it's important. So therefore stuff needs to happen. And I, I, I don't know. I, um, I like that stuff can probably also become a lot simpler. Uh, it should, it should. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the, the networking uh, stuff. Um, I was commenting today with somebody on my team. I also feel like as a data engineer, you definitely need to know it, but it's sort of like, it's the same way you need to know how to use a, a toilet plunger. Like, <laughs> you're going to have to use it at some point in an emergency, but I don't right. think that you should be doing it all the time, unless that's your thing, then right. become a network engineer. I have a lot right. of network engineer friends. They're awesome, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so that's interesting. Yes. You know, kind of the thing a data nerd here would like to ask too is, you know, I mean, we talk about tech and you, know, you obviously have a very distinguished career in, in the space, but what, what do you do outside of work? Um, you know, what, uh, well, so right now I have uh, three lovely daughters. That's so cool. Um, my oldest is five and a half and my youngest are twins who are three and a half. And so wow. um, any time that's not spent with work is spent uh, with, with them um, most of the time by choice, but not always. Sometimes, sometimes I'd, I would like to have uh, time to myself, but uh, the kids the kids very much still like to be with mom and dad. And so that's, that's quite fun. That's um, awesome. We, yeah, we, we go to parks, we do all of that sort of stuff before, before having kids, I was a pretty avid gamer. Um, mm -hmm. I did a bunch. Uh, I, I was into the MOBA games like league of legends and uh, Oh, I'm blanking on blizzards um, MOBA, not overwatch. That was an FPS, but anyway, um, I did a, a number of those. Uh, I played a lot of uh, World of Warcraft and mm -hmm. EverQuest, and so actually the naming of Druid uh, comes from that comes from that world from EverQuest. Oh, interesting. Um, because uh, the the idea, the idea, I, I'm not sure how much of a gamer you are, or how much you you do this stuff, but in like in the in these fantasy worlds with like World of Warcraft or EverQuest there's different classes you can be. And some of the classes are tanks that like take damage. Some of the classes are healers. Some of the classes are DPS, they deal damage. And you form teams, you like form groups of each of the independent classes and um, go and take on raid bosses or, or whatever. And each person kind of has, has the thing that they're good at. And when the team comes together, like none of those individual people could have destroyed the boss, but the team as a whole can destroy the boss. And the idea behind Druid is that the Druid class is a shape-shifting class. And usually mm -hmm. like when it's not in a shape-shifted form, it's a healer kind of damage, uh, magical damage type dealing thing. It can shape-shift into a tank. It can shape-shift into like a, a more physical DPS type thing, usually. Um, and uh, and so the the idea behind Druid was that the Druid class, with all of the shape shifting, is actually can form all of the roles of the team. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of the name of Druid was like this started out from the beginning as multiple processes, each doing one thing well, but as a whole, the system kind of achieves the, the greater purpose. And so the name Druid actually came from that because the Druid class is the one that can become all of the different parts to form the team to achieve, achieve the That's whole really thing. That's really cool. So, Were you guys a bunch of gamers then? Uh, yes. So 
I was a gamer. Um, Fangjin and Jian also gamers. I don't know that Vad, Vadim. I don't know that he's been a uh, uh, too big of a gamer. But like one one example, multiple years ago, Jian, Fangjin, and I uh, went to um, an esports thing. A uh, we we watched a League of Legends tournament in San Jose at one point. That was <laughs> that that was a. Uh, that was fun. Most of the other people were younger than us, but it was still, it was still fun. I think esports, esports is one of those interesting things as well that I, um, I don't know. It's as the current generation gets older and older, esports I think is gonna, it's just gonna become bigger and bigger. Oh, it's so big! It's crazy. I used to um, work at Aspro, which is mm. the uh, gaming headset company. Uh -huh. Um, so that was a lot of fun just getting to, uh, you know, meet all the, uh, East, these guys, they're like professional athletes or, uh, oh, yeah. celebrities or something. Yeah. And they get paid yeah. a lot of money these days. It's a big yep. deal. Um, so yes. yeah, people, older people always write it off. Like, oh, esports, like, what are you going to make a living from video games? It's like, hell yeah. I'm going to make a lot of money from video games yeah. and it's a lot of fun too. So well, that, that's the thing I used to make fun of it. I remember, um, I remember hearing about esports first as something that the Korean the Korean people would do, where they would yeah. watch people watch StarCraft and all of that stuff, right? And I was like, "What? They would you'll fill stadiums of people watching StarCraft? I play StarCraft. Why is why are you going to fill a stadium with people <laughs> watching StarCraft?" And I I like there was a point in time when I made fun of that idea. Then I started playing League of Legends, and then I started watching some of it on Twitch, mm -hmm. and I was like. Oh my God, these people are so good. This is awesome. Like, and, and then all of a sudden I got this appreciation and I was like, man, this is great. Esports is awesome. And then I realized that, yeah, it really is no different than any other sport. And the whole point of watching the sport is um, seeing someone who is so much better than you, someone who mm -hmm. has achieved a level that it is impossible for you to achieve in the thing and just be like, oh man what they're doing is awesome. I would love it if I could do that, but who knows? Um, but yeah, anyway. That's really cool. Well, the, the other, uh, on Saturday, I was watching, there was a, um, the financial modeling uh, competition. And it's like, it's like esports for um, Excel users. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. So it was just a, I, people with spreadsheets working wow. through problems. I was like, this is the nerdiest damn thing I've ever seen. And it's cool. And it's yes. basically like esports. Um, it's, is... it's Twitch for people with like the, you know, CFAs and stuff. <laughs> oh man, that yeah. is, yeah. Wow. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I really want to make a comment that is going to be in line <laughs> with me making fun of Koreans for watching Starcraft <laughs> that like five years from now, I'm going to be like, oh my God, I was so totally off base. This is awesome. <laughs> well, when, when Twitch came out, I don't know about your reaction, but I was like, really? That people do that they just watch other then when amazon bought them i was like okay i'm probably the dumb one at the table because you know every time i see something crazy happen in tech it's just like uh, you know anymore i just suspend disbelief honestly i'm like okay yeah that's gonna be something i don't know what it is but it's gonna be huge and sure enough twitch giant right yeah well and that and that's the thing like twitch started i believe as justin tv yeah as well um and i remember when it was justin tv it was like the streaming thing and i that there it was like i i don't know what the what this <clears throat> is i heard it became twitch i was still like eh, whatever then i got into league and watched something and i was like oh my god this is the biggest thing ever this is amazing and then amazon bought them right. and i was like amazon you are so smart that is like yes that's that's amazing um yeah i have the same reaction right now to stuff like nfts and whatnot i'm just like you know, personally, I feel like a, you know, an, an old man at this point looking at it, but <laughs> get off I mean, my lawn type stuff. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I grew up like in the first generation of the internet. Like, I think I got my first internet account in 92. This mm -hmm. is even before the web and just, um, you know, an early, a very early user of, of uh, the internet. And I, at that point, you know, the browser comes out, you start seeing all these, um, you know, 99 happens. And you're like, wow, this is interesting. I have no idea what any of these applications are. Uh -huh. You know, but but what I learned over time is just, you know, things happen and just don't be skeptical of, of technological yep. innovations because like uh, sometimes you don't get it and that's OK. Yep. <laughs> so. yep. No, absolutely. Um, so that 92, that would have been back in the day, like that would have been AOL CDs 
and they were just uh, starting to ship. I think it was like CompuServe was setting yeah. up some stuff. I had a, an account with um, who was it? Delphi. So it was uh, it was all t- uh, terminal based. So uh-huh. um, and I, you know, I don't know if you were around at the time. You you dial into like bulletin board services and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, just like I I didn't do the BBS thing myself, but there was this thing called the Imagination Network which was it, it was basically it was games over a bbs type thing and so it was it was like all about games and so i i, I did that where um uh, I, yeah i've been a an internet gamer may, maybe not since 92 probably 94 95 still that's early though that's way but, early yeah I was, I was so it wasn't it wasn't the muds were you um, playing like doom back then doom so this so i did i played some doom not i didn't play that much doom this was like before that there, there was this um oh what was it like the dungeons of yaserbia or some something like that i don't i don't know but it was like a it was a dungeon crawl type thing where you you pick a class you're a character you go you fight monsters you level up you i, I don't know uh that's cool yeah Fun times. It's, it's interesting just, you know, kind of, you know, kind of bring it back to just seeing the, uh, the evolution of, of tech and how people use it. Cause I think, you know, I mean, you wrote Druid as a response to something that was internet marketing, right? That wasn't even like a thing back in the, you know, the nineties. It was like, what Mar- marketing on the internet? Yeah. Have fun wasting your money on that one. Um, you know, 10 years <laughs> right. later and, you know, 2010, you're writing, you know, Druid to keep up with the amount of data that was coming through. Right. right. Kind of crazy yeah. how uh, everything goes. Yeah, absolutely. So. And now like TV media and that is uh, having to deal with like over the top, all the internet based media, streaming, YouTube, it's it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, man, cool. Well, probably a good place to wrap up. Um, yep. yeah, it's a pleasure talking to you. So um, like I said, big fan of what you created and um, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome to awesome to chat for people who want to learn more about you. Um, how can they do that? uh that's a good question i actually don't know uh it depends on for what purpose they want to learn more about okay perfect <laughs> how about how about imply and druid <laughs> yes it, uh, well they can go to imply.io to learn about imply uh at druid it's druid.apache or pretty sure it's druid.apache.org or apache or go to google type in druid apache or <laughs> druid apache it'll take you to the right place um yeah, you, you can you can learn more about it and and go from there. Awesome. Well, Eric, it's a pleasure, man. So have a yeah. good one. Uh, yeah, hope you have you. a fun day. All right, see you.